Dzień dobry, Krakow. How's it going? Super excited to be here. So I bet that most people here already know all the wonders when it comes to React Native for mobile development. But what I'm excited about is that with the support of so many other out of three platforms, you can also build applications that are really great and interconnected, not only for the desktop, but also for a bunch of different types of devices. This is a bit about the story about Expo Orbit and how you can launch your desktop apps with ease using React Native. Uh, oh, OK. So my name is Gabriel Donado. I'm a software engineer at Expo, and I work mostly on the SDK team. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind when developing your mobile app is usually the type of devices that it will run on. On a daily basis, people will often just use the iOS simulators and Android emulators, and most of the time, you're OK with just using your CLI. But other times, when you want to test something in a specific screen size or just install a development build in your physical device, things can get a bit more tricky. And here's where having the ability to manage simulators becomes so handy. Historically, the process of installing dev builds on Sims has always been a bit cumbersome. First, users were required to access our website and download a zip file. Then they would extract that, initialize their simulators or emulators manually through Android Studio or Xcode. After that gets initialized, you would then go and drag and drop your file into the device. This was especially a problem if you wanted to run a snack in your simulator. First, you would need to get Expo Go installed somehow. And after that, you from a simulator, you can't really just scan a QR code. So you would need to log into your account using your Expo credentials. And then finally, from the most recent list, you could launch your snack. And doing all those steps in a daily basis was just a bit too much. With that in mind, we started this proof of concept of an app that could just make everything so much simpler. The flow that we envisioned was really straightforward. When accessing a build on our website, users would just see one button that when pressed, it would interact with this utility app on your computer that it would do some magic and just get your app up and running in whatever device you wanted. Yeah, great idea. But how to build such a thing, right? In parts, Expo CLI kind of already covered a bunch of that. But if we think it doesn't really have a UI and most of its features are specific to the commands that we're running on, but the idea is, what if we could leverage all this functionality that's already built into Expo CLI, but just extract what we needed? Because if we take a closer look into the Expo CLI repo, we'll see that it's basically 100% JavaScript. And here we are all React Native devs, and we know that React Native just runs JS, right? So the idea was, why not just use React Native macOS that already runs JavaScript for this? And for this proof of concept, that's exactly what we did. We went through the documentation and just created a brand new React Native macOS project. This was super fun, but after a few very moments, uh, we noticed our first roadblock. How to reuse those functions from Expo CLI? Can we just import them directly? Can I just run npm install Expo CLI? And I won't say that we didn't try it, but things were not that simple. The TLDR here is that Expo CLI just relies on a bunch of Node.js-specific APIs, which are just not really available in a normal React Native environment. Uh, so the task of just reusing this code wouldn't be as easy as we thought of just importing and importing the functions directly from the Expo CLI. To circumvent that, our idea was to use a Node.js binary compiler. We ended up opting for PKG, but there are a few other solutions. This allows us to create a standalone executable that doesn't require the end user to have Node.js properly configured in their computer. And the good part is it could be easily just invoked from the proof of concept app that we were creating. With that, the idea is that we could just copy whatever code we wanted from Expo CLI and just implement this in a new custom internal CLI for this application. And in the future, if this proof of concept was to be validated, we, couldn't even, we could even have just a shared library that shares the, the logic for managing devices between the Expo CLI and this new internal CLI. And that way, we wouldn't need to re-implement any of this specific logic for managing devices. With this architecture, we have a UI using, in this case, React Native macOS that is constantly talking to this internal CLI through a simple NS task. This creates this compatibility layer that can kind of handle all different types of data, translate errors, and really just display any type of information that we want in our front end, per se. With that out of the way, we could just finally start focusing in our UI. For the interface of this app, 
The idea was just creating a menu bar app that listed all the available iOS simulators, Android emulators, and any type of physical devices that you have plugged in into your computer. Also, if they are connected on the same wireless internet, they should show up here as well. So from that list, the idea is that users could launch their devices and just install apps with just one click. For this proof of concept, this would include the basic support for some of the following things. So first, an auto-resizable menu bar window. So given the amount of devices that you have, it should just adapt to the screen size, some pretty basic stuff. So support for opening local files, aka just a file picker. Uh, support for OAuth in order to authenticate with Expo servers. Uh, some sort of navigation library that supported multiple windows. Because this is one thing that when you are developing mobile, you don't really think about. But on desktop, all the time, you'll just see multiple different windows, which would actually require a different React Native instance to be running on. And also, auto-updating, because we would need to tell users somehow that we got a new version when, after they downloaded from GitHub. And finally, uh, drag and drop support f uh, for just dragging your app directly into the menu bar and installing it. Now we kind of get into the fun part. Because when you start to implement all those features, we end up finding some peculiarities. The reality is that out of three platforms are just not as popular as React Native for Android and iOS. And because of that, you won't really find compatible libraries for the most things that you want to do. And this is likely the biggest downside point when it comes to out of three platforms. Because from simple checkboxes or using a navigation router system or an auto updating framework, you will just need to build things yourself. Here are some of the modules that we had to create for Orbit. And as you can see, we had to implement some pretty basic stuff. This is actually a great time to inform you all that Expo Orbit is 100% open source. And you can check all the code that I'll be referring here at github.com slash expo slash Orbit. The good news, though, is that in SDK 50, we added macOS and tvOS support to Expo modules. This is a quick example of a progress bar indicator that we had to create for Orbit. And as you can see, with just a few lines of code, you, we can expose these native components to direct, directly to React Native and build a UI that truly matches the macOS experience. Overall, just using Expo modules to build all those native components really sped up the development of our, our app and was one of the key factors that enable us to ship so fast. With the UI now implemented and most of the features that we want already developed, we just needed to establish some level of communication between our website, if you remember in the first few slides, and this utility app. If you ever use Slack, Linear, Discord, uh, you probably notice that most of the time, when you open their app, they will automatically detect that you have the uh, sorry, if you open their website, they'll automatically detect that you have the app installed on your computer. And they'll either prompt you to open the content that you're seeing inside the app, or they will do that automatically. But the problem is that from the browser perspective, there's simply no such API to check if an app is installed, and even less the features that it supports or which version it's running on. And the official native supported option would be just using a custom protocol. But you better pray for it to work, because you can't even detect if the app is really installed or if it was successfully opened or anything like that. If you have the app installed, the only thing that the browser will do is show this pop-up. And if you don't have the app installed, it won't show anything or give any feedback to the developer. So if we really wanted this interaction to be smooth, we would need to circumvent this annoying pop-up somehow. What we ended up doing, and most other apps do as well, is just running this local server while the app is open that can be fetched directly from our website, and we can retrieve whatever information we needed. For Orbit, we created two main routes, one that returns the status of the app, and another one that allows us to open builds directly. Here I have some quick tips if you want to do something like that. So always define a, a, a random set of ports, because a bunch of other applications may try to run a local server in the ports that you're using. And also, as a quick reminder, just to prevent unauthorized access, Make sure to check the request origin for whitelisted domains. Finally, for the users that still don't have the app installed, we can use in our website a library called Custom Protocol Check, which will detect when we try to open a deep link if we get the blur event for a small second. And if that blur event does, does not get triggered, this means that we should show the pop-up asking users to download our app. So combining all of this, we finally got our proof of concept working on macOS. And here's a quick demo of how you can launch simulators 
on Mac. And in a similar manner, here's how users can now just launch their builds from our website. I guess you kind of already see that with caddies and the other presentations, right? But the nice part is that this represents a 10x speed improvement in the developer experience of launching builds. This process that was done daily and used to take 50 seconds will now, in a normal day, only take five. And here's how you can do the exact same thing, but directly from Snack. So it's blazing fast. And given the flexibility provided that by the way that React Native works, we can easily implement a bunch of cool features, such as opening with Orbit directly from Finder. And those small details is what just makes the whole experience feel super native. So with all these pieces in place, the next logical step for us would be just adding support for update previews. As some of you may know, update previews re rely on this thing called runtime version of your app. And unfortunately, from an ADB and Xcode internal CLI perspective, you can't really retrieve all the necessary information for, from a remote app or a, an app that's not in debug mode. So to simplify that, what we did for Orbit was just try to download the latest dev build available on EAS for the specific runtime version that your update uses. And if that's not available for any reason, but you already have the app installed on your device, what we'll do is just fall back to the custom deep link schema and just launch the, the update directly for you. And as you can see, and again, this was kind of already shown, right? Uh, here's how you can launch updates super quickly. Cool. OK. So with the macOS version published and our proof of concept finally validated, it was time to start expanding to other platforms. Just a few days after the announcement, people already started asking, Windows support when? And to be honest, I generally thought it would just take another week. Infamous last words, right? Given that we use React Native macOS for macOS, it would be logical to think to just use React Native Windows for Windows. But sorry, Microsoft guys, we couldn't quite make it. Because React Native Windows just generates, or at least by default, it generates UWPs, which are universal window platform applications, which, to be honest, uh, they kind of work for most cases, but it wouldn't really cut for, act for Orbit. Because Orbit needs to perform tasks that are only available through the Win32 ecosystem. This includes things like working with any file on the disk without the user intervention, uh, reading keys from registries, or just using the system tray API. And in theory, we could make that work by creating our own custom Windows template and setting up a custom Win32 app. But Microsoft is already working on implementing Fabric. And along with that, React Native Windows will come by default with a Win UI 3 template, which would be compatible. But we're still kind of waiting for that. And when we developed Orbit, this was not available. So the solution that we found was to basically just rely on the great support that React Native Web and Expo CLI already provide for the browser and just go with Electron plus React, uh, React Native Web. Here are some of the reasons why. But overall, we. In that way, we could just export Orbit's bundle using React Native Web and load it inside this desktop environment through Electron. Electron comes with su full support for things that we would need, such as the Windows 3 API. And as it essentially just runs a Node.js process, we could directly invoke the, our JS CLI that was talking in the beginning without even having to rely on PKG to create the, the single executable application thing. There's also the fact that Electron has like, widespread adoption in the software industry as being the framework for creating cross-platform desktop applications. And a lot of big desktop apps that you use on a daily basis already use it, such as Linear, VS Code, Discord, and Slack. But we all know that Electron also has its own quirks, and this is especially when it comes to what we React Native developers would call native modules. So, Quickly explaining, the Electron architecture works similar to React Native in some aspects. It basically has two main processes, the main process and the renderer, which both have different responsibilities, but they talk through this thing called the context bridge. Just quick recap, when you want to install, when you want to develop your native module in Electron and essentially just use a function that 
that has access to the Node.js environment, you need to implement this in the main process. And for you to have access of this function inside the UI, you must first register it using the handle function on main. Then you go to the preload script and expose it through the context bridge and the IPC render invoke to then finally use it inside React Native Web, calling your function from global.dis. But doing this over and over would really slow us down, and we were moving in a really fast pace. Also, this would just add a bunch of boilerplate code to our repo. So we ended up creating this thing called React Native Electron Modules. With React Native Electron Modules, we can just use the same Expo module syntax that we are already familiar with and build our own custom Electron Modules with ease, but this time just using JavaScript. So from your Electron folder, you would just implement your module functions with full access to the Node.js API. So I can call directly, uh, can launch process, I can call spawn or anything. And the only requirement is that I export this using a unique name. After that, we register our module inside the main file. Uh, yes, doing that. And then you're kind of good to go. On the React Native website, you just need to call your module using React Native Electron module. And taking advantage of that, we were able to quickly implement all native modules one-to-one -one for Orbit on Windows. And the great part is this took like about three weeks or so. So here's a quick demo of Orbit running on Windows. Yeah. Cool. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me go back. OK. So let's talk about the future then. Uh, yes, future. Uh, do, so due to the way that we opted into extend Orbit to other platforms, and aka just use Electron, we kind of already support Linux, but we are still doing some final OK, so the folks that are clapping, you can already use this uh, if you check out the Orbit repo and just run it yourself. But we are doing some final testing, and binaries will be available very soon. So you can expect proper support for a bunch of distros coming out soon. Uh, as always, we are working to provide a deeper integration of Orbit into other Expo products. So you'll see things like opening builds directly from PRs and a bunch of other stuff. And please, if there's anything that you would want to see added here, just come reach and tell me your idea. Guys, this was a bit about the story of Expo Orbit. You can access our repo scanning this QR code. And yeah, please share your thoughts on it. I'll be here in the event today and tomorrow to answer any of your questions. And for any reason, if you can't find me here, you can always find me on GitHub as Gabriel Donadal and on Twitter as Donadal Dev. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>